Hey everybody, today I'm going to talk about the 2012 film, The Lorax. I feel like those words immediately invite a question. Uh, why? Why am I interested in this pretty bad, pretty irrelevant movie? Is there some secret thing that I want to talk about and I'm just going to use the Lorax as a way to talk about that thing? Well, no. Surprisingly enough, I really just want to talk about the Lorax. I think it's genuinely an interesting film, and if nothing else, my dream is that you've watched this video, chew it over, and think, yeah, Big Joel, you're right, the movie is interesting. Wow, that's a pretty humble dream there. Let's get started making it come true. Before I get into the 2012 Lorax, I think it's important to establish what it's ostensibly based on. For the purpose of this video, I'm gonna forget about the picture book and pretend like the 1972 cartoon was the original Lorax. It's really good and Dr. Seuss wrote it, so whatever. Gricklegrass, Gricklegrass, Street of the Lifted Lorax. More than anything, the first Lorax is a film dedicated to the relationship between two things, a truffula tree and a thneed. The entire story centers on the conflicted process by which the former object becomes the latter. What's that thing you made out of my truffula tree? Look, Lorax, calm down. There's no cause for alarm. I chopped down just one tree. I'm doing no harm. More than that, the film makes it as easy as humanly possible to substitute these objects for ideas. The Thneed, of course, isn't meant to be read as a thing that only bears on the world of the Lorax. It's meant to stand for commodities, all commodities. Thneeds are amorphous, they're efficient, and they fill any desire any person could possibly have. As such, they represent technological, capitalistic progress. Likewise, truffula trees are a simplistic metaphor for nature. They are pure, largely useless to humans, and easily destroyed. And it's through this accessible, symbolic language that the original Lorax makes a really clear point. When we turn over our future to systems that are only devoted to profit, the planet suffers tremendously as a result. The main reason why I'm giving you this reading that a literal first grader could figure out is to juxtapose it with the 2012 version. See, where the original cartoon is clean and pointed, the new movie is defined by its messiness and by its sheer number of elements. In addition to truffula trees and thneeds, there's bottled air, because the world has become so polluted that purchasing clean oxygen is necessary. There's fake trees that the citizens of Thneedville buy. The Onceler has a face now and seems motivated more by a sense of insecurity than by profit. There's a new antagonist, Aloysius O'Hare, a new protagonist, Zac Efron. There are walled cities that conceal things, and there are marshmallows. And honestly, just listing all of this, I, I feel like I need to take a deep breath. Because, you know, it's very easy to engage this film on its own terms, to recognize that it feels incredibly uninspired, and see that its number of elements are the fault of lazy, unfocused writing. But if we choose to engage the movie on different terms, try to read into it a cohesive vision, then what we have here is a lot of stuff that needs untangling. So let's begin our analysis at the first act of the movie, when we're introduced to Thneedville. On the face of it, the structure and economy of Thneedville seems to be a thinly veiled critique of capitalism. The citizens there are forced to purchase air that's supplied by Aloysius O'Hare. We can read O'Hare and the society he's created as a sort of dumbed-down, more extreme version of the original Lorax. Just like the Onceler, he's concerned only with profits and doesn't care about whatever negative results his actions might have. The more smog in the sky, <laughs> the more people will buy! <laughs> <laughs> but here's the thing. The film's surface-level critique of big, bad business doesn't really work at all. See, if we wanted to problematize O'Hare's business practices, our arguments would have to look something like this. When a person sells a thing, they're implicitly saying they're okay with not everybody being able to buy it. And if that thing is necessary to human survival, as air is, 
then not being able to buy it could cause some major problems. People might suffocate, they might be forced to do horrible work to stay alive. It might be pretty awful. But the Lorex doesn't make this argument. In fact, it seems to devote a tremendous amount of time and energy to not making this argument. From the outset of the film, Thneedville is presented as a sort of post-scarcity utopia. Nobody in this society seems to want for much, they all have enough to live comfortably, at least. And nobody seems to hate their jobs or work overly long hours, either. Even air, the thing that we would expect to cause some problems for the citizens of Thneedville, is a totally unconflicted resource in the film. I mean, we're told that people buy air, we see their home air supply, but all this doesn't seem like much of a problem. After all, people are able to go outside their houses without thinking about their oxygen supply. Who's paying for that outside air? Is it Aloysius? If so, how's he making money on that? Or maybe he's not making a profit on it, he just supplies that air out of the kindness of his heart. But, uh, in that case, what's stopping people from opening up their windows and getting some free air? Look, air is free, everybody. Problem solved. The point here isn't to get the Lorax for all of its juicy plot holes. It's to show that the movie has such a convoluted logic surrounding such a problem-free society that it can't possibly function as a direct critique of capitalism and its oppressions. So if Thneedville isn't meant to get at that sort of idea, then why is it there? What does the film want us to understand about this place? Well, to put it briefly, the movie makes one thing very clear. Thneedville is fake. The town represents a crude consumer culture, one that's deluged with a series of commodities which don't refer back to any concrete need or any real-life meaning. I think the most obvious place we can see this tendency is with the society's strange fixation on artificial trees. Thneedville is just filled with these things. At the beginning of the movie, we see this guy blowing up a fake shrub. And we learn, a little later on, that Zac Efron's mom is also really into them. And, you know, how strange is that? Here we have a group of people who haven't seen an organic tree in 50 plus years. What are those? Those are trees. But for some reason, everybody is obsessed with their likeness. As such, these fake trees stand for an absence. They refer back to nothing simply because there are no real trees left. And this idea that Thneedville is pervaded with absent or hollow signifiers comes up again and again in the first act. For instance, we learn that Aloysius wants to start selling bottled air. Well, here goes another lame Saturday. Dude, I don't think so. <laughs> huh? Hey. <laughs> but what need does that product fill? Everybody seems to breathe fine already, so the only way to sell such an object is to convince people that it solves a problem that it doesn't solve. Convince them that it will make them happy or more appealing or whatever. Or, let's look at one of my favorite lines from the movie. We pray to the Lord for all we've got, including this brand new parking lot. Ugh, gives me chills. We see this and things like it, and the idea is clear. Thneedville is a place where any semblance of authenticity or genuine meaning has been replaced with a vast and artificial commodity culture. And at this point, I kinda hope there's a movie that's springing up in the back of your head. Say it with me now. That's right. It's The Matrix. Yeah, The Matrix is a weirdly apt companion piece to the Lorax. Both films present a society that is inundated by false images and absence signifiers. Both center around a plucky hero who escapes that society and sees the world for what it is. And in both films, the protagonist decides that the real, dismal world needs to be revealed. I would go so far as to say the Lorax and the Matrix are almost thematically identical. In fact, there's only one place that the films seem to differ on a conceptual level. But it's a really, really important place. See, there's a huge presupposition that exists at the heart of the Matrix. That the Matrix can be escaped. Yeah, it's hard, and not everybody can do it, 
But when Neo takes that red pill and wakes up in a world totally unlike the one he's always known, the audience is supposed to accept that this place is real. Things have substance here, actual meaning. They have a sense of worth that transcends anything the Matrix could offer. You've been living in a dream world, Neo. This is the world as it exists today. And it's this presupposition that the Lorax seems to take issue with. Not only does the film problematize the idea that there can be some escape from the ideological conditions of our culture, it also questions our very ability to delineate what is fake from what is real. So you can see what I mean by that, let's talk about truffula trees and the world they seem to represent. As I said before, truffulas in the original Lorax are a really easy symbol to understand. They don't get their value from what they can do for us or how pleasant they are. Rather, their meaning is intrinsic. They constitute the natural world and they facilitate all sorts of life that is totally unrelated to human society. And when the Onceler destroys the forest, when he chops down the last truffula tree, that's not bad for a lot of reasons. Not bad because he won't be able to make thneeds anymore or something like that. It's bad for one reason. The environment was good, and it kinda sucks that it's just gone now. It really is as simple as that. But when we move to the 2012 Lorax, truffulas are no longer simple at all. And we can start to see how complicated and sort of unnerving their depiction is by looking at the reasons that characters want to have them again. See, the value that truffulas have is not intrinsic in this movie. Protecting the environment isn't its own reward anymore. Instead, the film gives us three extrinsic reasons why trees are good. First, they enable the protagonist to date the lady he likes. In the inciting scene of the movie, Zac Efron and his love interest, Taylor Swift, have a conversation. A real living tree, growing in my backyard. So if, say, I'm just thinking out loud here, if a guy somehow got you one... Well, I'd probably marry him on the spot. Here, truffula trees are posed as a MacGuffin. Their value is totally instrumental. He can use their seeds to get the girl he needs. Second, trees solve the supposed air crisis of Thneedville. As we know by now, Aloysius profits on air sales, and since truffulas provide free air, part of their goodness comes from their ability to disrupt this mean guy's mean business. But I remember when trees were everywhere, and no one had to pay for air, so I say, let it grow! Third, and maybe most importantly, Organic trees are used to appeal to a sense of nostalgia and childlike wonderment. When Taylor Swift talks about how much she likes truffulas, she never mentions the forest or the creatures who live there. Instead, she's only concerned with the ways trees can signify, how they can function as a powerful, potent object in her life. They used to grow all around here. And people said that the touch of their tufts was softer than anything even silk, and they smelled like butterfly milk. And here, considering these three motivations, we can start to ask the question, what is the difference between a truffula tree and the bottled air that Aloysius wants to sell? There really isn't one, is there? Both convey the idea that they will make you more desirable, get you dating the person you want to date or whatever. Both solve the supposed air problem, albeit in different ways and both serve as commodities, representing some absence in the consumer that needs to be filled. And if these two objects, bottled air and truffulas, are fundamentally the same, then what does it mean to escape from the former object and go to the latter? Nothing is what it means. It means nothing. And as such, we can see how the film problematizes the passage from fake consumer culture into the quote-unquote real world. There is no escape in this movie, because the prospect of escape, the symbol that represents escape, is interpolated as just another commodity within a commodity culture. And this theme becomes so much more potent in the most iconic scene of the film, where the Onceler destroys the entire forest and sings this song. How bad can I be? I'm just doing what comes naturally. How bad can I be? I'm just doing what comes naturally. 
Jeez, I, I feel like that line is just so dense with meaning. I mean, look, we're watching this movie, right? And the movie is supposed to be about a conflict between two worlds. The world of commodity and industry, and the world of nature. But in one little line, the film calls into question the idea that there's a difference between those two worlds. Within the Wunstler's imagination, truffula trees and the life they produce aren't really natural in any meaningful way. To him, our vision of nature is prefigured by a higher order of naturalness, one defined by consumption and ownership. And you might be thinking right now, isn't the Wunstler an antagonist? Why would we assume that when he says, I'm just doing what comes naturally, that he's supposed to be right about that? What if he's just deluded himself, and what he's doing to the environment isn't natural at all? Well, that's fair enough, but then we have to ask, if the Wunstler is wrong, well, how is he wrong? What does nature mean that the Wunstler isn't getting? See, it's not really important if the Wunstler is doing something natural or unnatural here because the second he raises that idea, the word nature suddenly has no clear referent within the film's logic. It could be a bunch of trees and the animals that live near those trees, or it could be a disposition to destroy and consume weak things. The idea of nature that appeared concrete and easy to parse is revealed to be as constructed and convoluted as the society Zac Efron thought he was escaping. In the final moments of the Lorax, we're left with one clear image, a truffula tree planted in the center of Thneedville. And I think that image is maybe the most important thing about the movie, because this film is not the original Lorax. Where that cartoon poses trees as inherently good, this version sees them only as instrumentally good. I mean, the most important place to put one is in the center of town, where it can be used and enjoyed for all its sweet air or whatever. And this film isn't The Matrix, either, where that movie shows us an iconoclast who escapes a world of artificiality and accesses the real. The Lorax troubles those waters and presents a culture that seems to absorb realness. The tree, and the concept of nature that it represents, is thrust back into Thneedville and becomes a symbol like any other. And it's because the 2012 Lorax is neither of those things that it's able to present an idea that I think is really unique and interesting. It suggests that when a society is only able to speak a language of commodities and untethered symbols, then there really is no going back on that. In the culture of Thneedville, the acts of preservation and restoration are really just alternate forms of consumption. And what I think is so cool about this movie is that if a director intentionally decided to express that message, it would probably be, like, super judgy. Oh no, people like buying stuff, people like commodities, their language consists only of absent signifiers. What a nightmare. But the Lorax is so thoughtless, and it's made to be so easy to watch, that this idea can be expressed in a really loving, carefree way. Thneedville isn't so bad, after all. It's just sorta what it is. Love it or leave it. Oh wait. You can't. I thought that was a, a sort of spooky way to end things. Uh, so that's all I had to say about the Lorax. Hope you enjoy that. I know I did. And now it's time for my Patreon question of the week. Uh, sorry about the change in audio, by the way. I'm recording this very late. Someone who wants to be known as Big Fan asks, A movie like God's Not Dead, that's to say a movie that is expressly made for a specific audience, on first glance might seem to be devoid of philosophical exploration. Same could be said about The Bachelor or The Room. How do you decide which ideas or movies to explore on the channel? And I guess I kind of have a simple-ish answer to this one. Uh, I just love all the things I talk about. Uh, I know that sounds kind of strange when I make stuff about, you know, Logan Paul or God's Not Dead, but honestly, I just love those things. Maybe not for how they wanted to be appreciated, but nonetheless, uh, there's just something in them that makes me feel really happy or interested or whatever. I love the Lorax. I really, really do. Uh, anyway, with that, I'll say goodbye. Uh, like, comment, and subscribe, and I'll see you next time.